I was looking all around. Okay, uh, so I'm still getting my class, my classroom section going here. Uh, as soon as I have that going, we'll uh, go ahead and get started with the uh, broadcast. I have zero zero viewers right now, so it doesn't matter. But it's recording. I'll watch it. Awesome. The, I forgot that my negatives on my house. Okay, because I, I didn't specify. T turn it in. I did specify. Oh, Don't I say I didn't specify. It's in the rubric. It's in the the syllabus. Yeah. I say it every time I talk about this. Yes, you're required to turn in your your negatives. So yeah, toss it in there. And then if you are missing anything, turn in your assignment as completely as you can into the box. You should have your negatives. You should have a contact sheet. You should have uh, the exposure log, and you should have one cut line that you, you've selected one photograph, you've written one cut line for that photograph. So four things you should be turning in to my little box right here. Okay, I didn't understand the cut line thing, so I need an additional cut line just for one. I didn't have to fill out that whole thing. The exposure log and the cut line are two separate things. The exposure log, you're getting cut line information, you're taking it down, but you're not actually writing a clean, concise cut line. You're just basically writing notes. Cut line, remember we talked about cut line? We, I brought up that uh, handout, and like a cut line would be like uh, uh, LCCC soccer player Shawnee Griffiths takes a shot on goal during the October uh, 14th game against the Eastern Florida uh, State College Titans. The Golden Eagles won 57 to nothing. You know, <laughs> they're not going to win 57 to nothing. I'm hoping they're going to win, though. Um, okay. Can we get those negatives back after you finish? No, I'm going to uh, uh, put them on my grill, start my grill up, and have a fire. Yes, of course I'm going to give you your stuff back. I am going to talk really quickly about the second assignment, though. The second assignment rubric is up in D2L. The second assignment rubric is based on this lecture I'm about to give. It's uh, basically, I'm having you guys do, you're going to be doing uh, base, uh, your next shooting assignment. Uh, you're now going to make prints, and now you're going to be focusing on form, value, space, shape. And part of the lecture today is actually about abstraction. So we're talking about composition for the first time, and we'll talk about abstraction. It's, it's, I think it's a good starting point because we want to talk about getting good clean prints, focusing on uh, shooting things that you wouldn't normally shoot. And that's kind of the point of this class as well, is that we're, I want to push you guys beyond the snapshot aesthetic. So uh, that information is up there. If you're shooting digital, there's two separate rubrics. One rubric for shooting film, one rubric for shooting digital. And then if you have questions, uh, you can, of course, email me and talk to me about that. But what I, the, what I wanted to talk about is, is that expect that I am going to mark on your prints. And I know that that's like sacrilege. Like some of you guys are like, no. Okay, but this is a class. And so I need to be able to like, you know, circle a point. You know, a point on the on the print, and then right into the rubric. You know, watch for border mergers. Okay. Consider doing. And so, what I would do is, I'm gonna, because I, I know some of you guys are really excited about the prints, and I get that. And I'm excited about the prints too. That's fantastic. If you have a print that you are super excited about, print two of them. Okay. Now, this does not mean that I am going to mark on your prints all the time. Okay, it just depends. I'll try not to, but if I feel like I need to uh, communicate visually and like try to, you know, and I'll try, I try to as much as I can fill out the rubric and actually type out, you know, to consider doing X, consider doing Y. So if I can, you know, effectively evaluate your homework without writing on your print, I will do so. But I want you guys to be prepared that I may write on your prints with uh, wax markers, okay? And uh, like, I'm getting like, uh, the looks I'm getting right now, it's like, how could you? This is my art. So if you have a print that you are really, really in love with and you've spent time and you're in the dark room and you make one, make another one, okay? So that you have two of that just in, on, the on the off chance that I do mark on it. I may not mark on it, but there's a chance I will. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always going to give you guys your homework back. Yeah, everything will get back to you. The only time I end up throwing anything away is if, like, you just never return and 
And I'll even like at the end of the semester when you turn in your last assignment, I'll like try, I'll give you time. In fact, I just now threw away uh, just it was just this week threw away a couple of assignments from the spring semester. But I've been hanging on to those since May. So just yeah, I'm not gonna like what's that? Yeah, I mean, I always hope that students are going to come back for their work. I really do. So, <laughs> well, you, hey, you know, you would be surprised. I know that you guys think I'm an ogre, but yeah, stu students do come by and say hello from time to time. All right. So, questions on that before I get going? Okay. I like. I, I'm going to repeat again for those of you who came in late. I'm cutting class short today. I have a broadcast this afternoon. Uh, we, uh, the student media organization, we're doing a broadcast of the soccer game. So the soccer game starts at 3.30, so at 3 o'clock, uh, even if I have to, like, talk really fast and do it like, until I'm out of breath, or, like, I'll, maybe, I'll get Eric to come up here because I think he talks a little faster than I do. <laughs> uh, one way or another, I'm getting through this thing by 3 o'clock, okay? start on a good tangent. No, I'm going to cut the tangents off. I know you guys like the tangents. Hell, I like the tangents, but we're going to cut them. We're going to cut those down. Okay. So, hey, let's see if I can. There we go. Okay, so we're talking about composition today. I'm going to talk about the different ways that we can uh, improve our photography now. Uh, we spent the first few weeks of class just working on technical considerations. You guys should have today, uh, whether you're online or face-to-face, -face, uh, turned in uh, your first uh, set of uh, contact sheets and whatnot today. And uh, as I told you guys, you know, I didn't require anything as far as the types of photographs. I was just trying to help you guys get comfortable with metering and making exposures manually. We're now going to step it up. We're going to talk about composition. And every single time you guys turn in a new assignment now, I'm going to give you, you know, more... Uh, more uh, qualifications I'm going to look for in your in your work. So uh, today we're talking about composition. <laughs> On our agenda, uh, we're going to talk about composition. So base, I have some basic compositional guidelines, and I think I've had a couple of you in my digital photography class. It's the same ones from my digital photography class. Uh, but we'll talk about those. We're going to talk about form and shape. Just you know how you know these basic design concepts work in photography. Uh, we're going to actually look at these uh, and talk about uh, you know, how a lot of photographers have engaged in these. Again, I'm trying to get you guys, I'm, I'm trying to challenge your idea of what photography is. So I'm going to show you a lot of photography and I've had students that like, they're like going through like anger management in the middle of class because they're like, that's not photography. And we'll have plenty of talks about, uh, conversations about, you know, I don't know, the validity of different forms of photography. Today we'll start that. We're going to start talking about uh, the different forms of photographic involvement. Uh, the, fo the forms of photographic involvement, and that is actually in D2L, uh, a little handout for you guys to print out. Uh, but that's actually kind of a framework for us to look at uh, photography in. And specifically today we're going to be looking at uh, representational artistic involvement. Uh, with abstraction. So we have, there's depictive, there's representational, there's, uh, assist, uh, I'm sorry, constructed and assisted reality. Those are the four we're going to talk about. And we talk about them, we use these as a kind of a framework to discuss different types of photography. You know, how, you know, give us, uh, you know, uh, different ways of examining, uh, you know, and applying meaning to different photography. And then, of course, we're going to look at abstraction. And I've kind of already talked about the next assignment. It is based on, essentially, uh, uh, form, shape, value. That's what we're doing. So I probably won't talk too, about, too much about it toward the end of class. Right. So uh, composition, uh, like I said, uh, this is I, I give a similar lecture to, uh, that, uh, to the beginning of this in my digital photography class. So I kind of go through it quickly, and it's, and it's fairly basic. So we have six guidelines that are going to help us out. And interestingly enough, they may seem incredibly simple, but uh, there's, there's a lot to them. Uh, some of these are based on, uh, you know, uh, graphic design, art, you know, what we understand about graphic design and art. And then others are, they, 
they, they don't even really seem to make that much sense. It seems kind of like silly rules, but there's a lot of, you know, psychology you know, that, that we have to base these guidelines on. Okay, so again, the six guidelines, we have simplicity, rule of thirds, lines, balance, framing, and mergers. Okay, and they're all kind of interconnected. So simplicity, we've actually already talked about simplicity a little bit in this class. We, uh, we're trying to figure out where to stand so that... The, the lecture is up online as well anyway, but I'm just trying to make sure people can see from here. So we talked a little bit about simplicity already. In case you missed it, Eric, I'm recording this lecture. Okay. You looked confused. <laughs> Maybe you just kind of looked that way. <laughs> I'm giving, this is, today is the day that I'm going to give Eric a hard time. I'll switch to you here in a little while so you don't feel left out. Okay. All right. Anyway, okay, so simplicity, we've talked about it. The, the, the idea is simple. If you are shooting a subject, you want to make sure that your sub subject is known and understood. You don't want to shoot the subject in such a way that there are distractions or questions as to what the true subject of the photograph is. All right? So it's, it, there's not much to it. You know, we talked about it in terms of uh, portrait, and I think it was, I was Lindsay, yes? All right, good. Hey, I'm starting to get names. Uh, but I was talking about taking uh, Lindsay's uh, portrait. And if I want to take a picture of Lindsay, uh, you know, how, what do I? What are the kinds of things I might want to do taking that photograph? How would I simpl simplify that if I'm taking it right now? She's in the classroom. There's people behind her. There's monitors behind her. What did we say was some of, one of the things we could do? Simplify. How do we simplify it, though? Okay, so we could change the backdrop. We can move, all right? I mean, and there's lots of different ways I could move. I mean, I could use a different angle. I could move to the left. What else can I do? Or I could actually introduce an artificial backdrop. Okay, what else? Okay, so I can control depth of field. That's, that's the context we were talking about last time we talked about this. Is we were talking about controlling depth of field. So, yeah, I want to focus on her face. I want to use those three things that we can uh, control, uh, that we can use to manipulate depth of field. What are our three things we can use to manipulate depth of field? Aperture. Aperture, okay. Not, not sure. How does aperture manipulate depth of field? The smaller your aperture is, the farther your depth of field. Okay, so smaller aperture, which is a larger number, we have a deeper depth of field. And then if I'm doing that portrait with Lindsay, the opposite of that would be <laughs> wider is a shallower depth of field. Okay, so that's one. What else? What were the, what were the other two? Your feet. Your feet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna move closer to her. The closer I am to her, the shallower of depth the depth of field will be. The further away I am, the deeper the depth of field it will be. So, and then the last thing would be you actually said it, Floyd. Yeah, so the, length, the, uh, the focal length. So if I use a longer focal length, I'm also compressing the depth of field. So if I use a longer focal length, a wider aperture, move a little bit closer to Lindsay, I'm going to compress that depth of field. I'm going to make the image simpler. It's going to make it a lot easier for people to tell what the subject of my photograph is. And then just an example. of, And I actually, uh, it's probably now a good time to talk about, I uh, kind of, I have tried. Some of them are robust, some of them not so much, but I have tried to curate a number of uh, boards on Pinterest to kind of help you guys out with just like ideas. So if on any of these assignments you're thinking, well, what can I do that isn't the basic, you know, the same thing I'd always shoot, go on there and take a look. I have photography I admire, you know, and then, uh, and you guys will uh, start to make fun of me because you're going to find, I. I really like black and white photography. I really favor black and white photography. It just kind of happens that way. So most of the photographs that I post on there are black and white. Uh, but I have, I actually have shutter speed, depth of field, you know, uh, simplicity, rule of thirds, lines, a, a boards basically themed to go along with some of these compositional guidelines. Yes? And it looks the picture stuff is quite on YouTube. Right. Uh, actually, it's in the syllabus. So uh, if you go in the syllabus uh, down uh, in my, uh, several pages in, <laughs> you'll have a link to my YouTube and my and my and my Pinterest and all that good stuff. Okay. 
All right, uh, rule of thirds is the next one. Rule of thirds, and this is another simple one, but that we really can't, I, I can't stress enough how important it is. Rule of thirds is a really simple concept. Essentially, things that people prefer images that are shot off center. Okay, that, that, that's how simple this is. They prefer it for all kinds of different reasons, okay? One of the reasons why is that images that are shot where the subject is centered, the image will feel much less active. That's, that's it's, it's kind of a passive image. It's, there's not movement. Like a mugshot? Perhaps, yeah, a mugshot would be an example of that. Images where we use rule of thirds to dictate where our subject is going to be, it will feel more active. They will, they, you know, there will be more movement to these photographs, okay? And we use this to our advantage in a lot of different ways. And how many of you guys have seen, like, on a, on a digital camera that you can actually, it's just part of the software now, that rule of thirds, it just comes up. It's on your cell phones, for crying out loud. Okay, that's how prevalent this is. Okay, there's lots of different ways that we can use rule of thirds, all right? Uh, you can just do it just to, like, I'm, I'm, you know, in relation to this board here, I got the rule of thirds going on, and I have movement into the board. Okay, that's one way we can use it. But there's other ways we can use it. One of the things, other things we talk about is uh, horizon lines when we talk about rule of thirds. To, instead of leaving a horizon line in the center of an image, to actually move it to the upper third or the lower third. Okay, that, that's, that's another way that we can use rule of thirds. Uh, and then notice when I talked about myself in relation to this board here, and I'm kind of pointing this direction, uh, I'm, I'm using the rule of thirds to move into this frame. Like, I wouldn't want to and I'm, uh, stand on this side and point out of the frame. Okay, so when we use rule of thirds, we're, we're going to use those directional qualities to our advantage. Okay, we're going to try to deliberately control how the eye moves through an image, all right? And then, that's actually not a, it's a good uh, example uh, in, this, in the sense that it's all kind of on the right and the eye is on the third there. But I'm a little distracted by this here, being right in the middle, so, yeah. Do you ever use any of your pictures that you've taken? Uh, yeah, every once in a while, mostly I use them as bad examples. <laughs> it's like, don't do this. This guy's terrible at this. No. Um, actually, I don't know why I'm so weird about using my own work, but I don't a lot. Uh, and there's a couple of different reasons why. Uh, one, I guess just like anybody else, I'm a little bit sheepish about my own work. Although, you know, I don't know why I would be. Uh, I, do, I, I put it out there. I mean, if you, if, you're, if you look at my social media, you can find my Flickr account. It's, uh, there's hundreds of images, thousands of images out there. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I guess the, uh, another reason why uh, I, I don't uh, show a lot of my own work is because uh, I try to, like, well, there's, I, I, I don't want it to be about me. And then I've also had students who, they see my work and they're just like, oh, I hate myself. And then I have to, like, explain it. It's like, well, I've been doing this for a little while. <laughs> you know, give yourself a break. It takes some time. And I don't even think my work's, I mean, I think my work's, I, I enjoy my work. But I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys I think I'm the greatest photographer in, even in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm not, I'm not even the, uh, the greatest photographer within 100 yards of here because uh, Mike Smith and Ty Stockton over in public relations are damn fine photographers. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it's I, 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 for, what, for a number of reasons, I just, I don't know why. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not big on putting my own work up there. When I talk, when I do, when I, I do a lot of bad examples, because like when you're looking for good examples, you can find them, you know. But then, and then there are a lot of bad examples out there as well. But when I want a bad example, then I'm like, well, where did I find a bad, well, I shot that one thing, that didn't work. <laughs> so I'll so, you'll sometimes see my work as an example of what not to do. <laughs> okay, lines. Now lines, this is a huge one. We're scratching the surface here. I'm, get, I'm giving you guys almost like a 30,000 uh, you know, foot view of this. Lines are tremendous. This is where the graphic design qualities kind of come into it. And for those of you, I actually have a couple of people in here who are in my computer graphics class. We talk about how people perceive different types of lines. Okay, that like 
a, a line can mean so many different things. The direction of the line, the directional quality of the line can mean stability, it can be rest, it can be active, it can be sensual. There's all kinds of different ways that we can kind of, that our mind interprets line. That helps you, uh, like, uh, you know, you're talking about in uh, your practice class, too, is like, uh, Absolutely, yeah. That's another, Eric makes a good point. A lot of the things that we talk about when we took look at how people perceive artwork, uh, culture is is a big part of that. And so, how we perceive something, you know, here in this region would be, you know, taken differently in a, in a different, you know, even just another region of the United States, or certainly much different in another part of the world. So that is part of how we would communicate visually as well, yes. Um, but we also can use line kind of rather simply. I mean, we're going to look at actually some images where we are looking at use of line, and there is a very strong graphic design quality to some of these photographs. But in a lot of cases with uh, line and photography, we're just using it to, as a directional quality. That's, you know, there's a lot of, we talk, we talk about, uh, the directional quality of their movement of in a photograph, and we call we actually call it vector when we uh, identify the directional quality of a piece of artwork. Um, but line is one of the ways that we can do that. So, and, and a lot of the time, we want to make sure that we, when we compose, we are using the elements within the frame to move the eye the way we, we, we want to direct the attention to something. We don't want to direct the attention, like again, like the attention off of the frame, away from the information. We want to move, you know, we want to be careful about you know, whether or not we're using those directional qualities, lines in some cases, in a meaningful way so that we're you know, conveying a message, we're making the composition as strong as we possibly can, okay? Uh, but lines can do all kinds of, you know, they, they suggest activity. There's this idea of, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, you know, uh, we talk about gestalt, that our minds actually, uh, are, we're always searching for meaning. We, in fact, that's one of the fun things about abstraction in photography. It's, it's kind of, in fact, it's uh, kind of a unique thing when you look at abstraction. When an artist who's using paints creates abstraction, they can create anything. It's completely imaginary. And so there's this disconnect. Uh, you know, I mean, the people are trying to apply meaning to it. They're trying to decipher what it, perhaps what it is. But in a lot of cases, they can create a lot of separation between, you know, uh, a, an object that people typically understand and what they're trying to convey. They, that's how, why it's so abstract. But how do we do that with photography? It's a photograph inherently, what, are the, what do people do when they look at a photograph? What's the first thing they do? They try to identify what it is. What am I looking at? So if, abstraction in photography is actually kind of an interesting thing because if you do, you know, if, as part of this project, some, you're not required to actually do, you know, engage in abstraction. I just think it's a great way to potentially look at form, space, value. Uh, but if you do do that, one of the fun, the, you know, the interesting fun things to do is that you're focusing so closely on line and shape and value that you're actually trying to uh, create separation between the, what the actual object and the, the person's ability to you know, perceive what that is. And hopefully get them to kind of think about it in different ways. Okay? But lines are a big part of that. So again, back to this idea of you know, our mind is always trying to you know, decipher and apply meaning to things. <laughs> and uh, this is obviously, a, you know, uh, uh, we have this great directional quality to these lines. It, the lines lead us out into the distance here. Leading lines are one of, one of the things that you'll hear a lot when we talk about photography, when we're talking about lines. Am I giving you guys motion sickness yet? Hanging in there with me? All right. Um, balance is another one. This has, there's, uh, again, uh, we're, it's, it's very artistic. There's a lot of graphic design quality. And there's, 
you know, we're this is 30,000 foot view. There's all kinds of different ways to look at this. We uh, talk about when we t when we're talking about it in a graphic design sense, we talk about uh, symmetry. So, and, and we're not necessarily looking for symmetry, particularly in photography, even though that last image we actually, that we had actually did have, you know, some amount of symmetry, okay? So, uh, the balance can actually refer to a number of things. It can refer, again, to how we're using elements to move the eye through the image. Are we purposely trying to create some imbalance that in, in such a way that we're, you know, we're trying, are we trying to create tension? But you know, are we using light and dark well to bring to you know to bring the eye to the subject? Uh, so uh, it, this this is fairly subjective. And of course, they really kind of all are in a way. Uh, which actually brings me to another point that I want to talk about. We we call them guidelines, and I'll I'll tell people like they're guidelines. They're not a prison. Okay. So and I think it was the. Um, there's a quote out there that I like. It's something like, uh, uh, "Knowing, you know, all of the uh, knowing, knowing how to use the elements and principles of design will not make a great designer or artist out of you any more than knowing the rules to the English language will make a Hemingway out of you." Okay, so we learn these things as a way to help us to improve our images. But you know, we learn the rules, we break the rules, we it, it, we we compose images to try to communicate what we want to communicate. So my point here is, is that it's not like a checklist. It's not like, okay, uh, do I have simplicity? Yep, I'm good. Uh, rule thirds, yeah, I got that. There, oh, there's lines. I have, you know, I'm using balance. Uh, I, I have framing, which we'll talk about next. The fact that I have simplicity probably means that I don't have any mergers. There we go, all six guidelines, and the photograph may still suck. Okay. So they're to help you. That doesn't necessarily mean that like it's a formula for success, right? And then again, balance can be seen, in, you know, uh, taken in all kinds of different ways. I don't even. I must not have. Where did it go? Hey. <laughs> oh, it's probably this is probably my image. My my Prezi's busted. Okay, but here's an example. You know, we have uh, we do have some symmetry. We have some. Uh, along the horizontal line there. Um, so, but there's all kinds of different ways to look at that as well. We have a balance of light and dark. We do have some objects that are larger that will draw our eye. So again, all kinds of different ways that we can look at balance in an image. Okay, now framing is one of these ones that actually, uh, I, we call it framing, but uh, sometimes students get caught up on the idea of like a frame. And what we're talking about when we're talking about framing isn't necessarily uh, the idea of uh, like I, I've had students in the past like uh, I'll do like an exercise. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shoot images with framing now, and they go out and they find. And actually, once this year, uh, a few years ago, I had these two students. They were I shared a dorm room together, and for the framing exercise, they they went out and they just walked a neighborhood, found house, two trees in front. And then the next student, his buddy that stayed in the same dorm room with him, house and two trees in front. Okay, so framing is not like I'm putting goalposts up in the in the foreground of all of my images, and I and I'm not doing you know I'm not trying to actually put like a true frame in front of my uh, you know subject. The idea of framing is that we have this you know three dimensional world, and then we're running around with this device that turns this three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional image. So framing is the idea that we want to, when we can, layer objects in our composition to give the indication of depth. It makes the image feel more dynamic, helps with movement, you know, gives us that feeling of three dimensions in many cases. Uh, it could be, yeah. I mean, because we could do it well and we can do it badly, uh, and, and and we could argue that that's. I'll say that that's doing it well. Eric's asking if we could use it for uh, doing like uh, forced per perspective, and you know, you guys have seen this. You know, people use it in kind of fun ways. Like if you've seen the photographs where it's like, you know, I, I'm I'm holding the moon. Here we go. 
I'm, I'm holding this photograph. You guys can't see what I'm doing, but I can see it here. So uh, that's kind of the forced perspective thing is because if our depth of field is deep enough, we can make it appear that objects are right next to each other. So yes and no. I mean, you can use it that way. That's one way that you could use framing. You could use it creatively. Like, you know, I love the ones where it's like, I don't even know how they do this. There's one that I saw that I really liked. Someone actually uh, got someone to, it was probably photoshopped, but jumped up and it was like they were doing like a jump shot. And then there was a, so it's a silhouette and then there's a basketball hoop and somehow they got the moon to align with the hands. It's probably photoshopped. But that's, uh, would be an example of what Eric's talking about. And that's, a pretty common theme and there's a lot of fun stuff in fact if you guys look at my Pinterest boards you will find tons of that there's uh, one that I really like where someone did a bokeh effect which is when the lights blow out because you have sh such shallow depth of field and the lights are actually it looks like these blown out lights are pouring into a cup so it's kind of fun there's some fun stuff but I you know what I look at it when we're talking about more traditional straight photography not that we should be I am not a big, huge fan of landscape photography. You guys will find as we go through this class. I like landscape photography. I'll talk, I have plenty of great stories to talk about landscape photography. In fact, I'm much better with landscape photography after now having gone through myself a landscape photography workshop that helped me to kind of give me give me some ideas as to how to approach my own landscape photography. Anyway. Uh, but we, we, we want to use framing in most cases to give those indications of depth. <laughs> Just so you know, the, my thing with landscape photography is, is that everybody's doing it. Everybody wants to be a landscape photographer. And my thing is, is like how is what you're, what you're doing or what you want to do different or adding something? And not just the same damn photographs that everybody else is doing. Um, and there, in the uh, landscape photography workshop that I took this summer, I, I helped out with it. But you know, she was a fantastic photographer. I learned a, a ton from her. And a couple of things that she said that just really resonated with me is that she even went through that. Here's this woman who's a landscape photographer, is literally writing books, going out doing artist and res residence programs. Just did. Uh, do you guys know where Acadia National Park is, out east? She just did a fall at Acadia workshop. I mean, so she, the, the woman does these workshops, landscape photography workshops. And she talked about how, as a landscape photographer, she got to a point in her own career where she was felt kind of like I do about landscape photography. And that is, what am I, I'm bored. I don't even feel anything for this. Why am I doing this? And she, and she, and she said what I, when I think about a, a lot of landscape photography, I'm just making pretty pictures. And on, you know, on one hand, there's nothing wrong with just making pretty pictures, but I, I think that's what's wrong with a lot of landscape photography, is it's just, here's this thing that's beautiful, and I'm going to do an incredibly good job of capturing it from a technical standpoint, but I'm not implying any meaning on it. And so actually part of her workshop was, that was really great. She was trying to help people to connect. She was... Uh, and I'm going to try to uh, start using this with you guys because I think it's just amazing. It's like when you look at something and you want to take a photograph of it, why do you want to take a photograph of it? What, what's going on in your head? How are you emotionally attaching with that? What made you stop and think, I want to take a photograph of that? Just decipher what that is. Figure it out what it is that made you stop, that gave such impact to you. Okay, now think about how are you going to compose that in such a way that you can communicate to someone else visually what you're feeling. So it would be like, sort of like, you know, uh, like you were saying, like, just like getting a pretty picture would be like letting nature be the artist as opposed to you being the artist behind you. Right? No, actually the other way around. Instead of just letting nature be the artist, you're trying yeah, to, so what, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's what you want to yeah, you, so again, it, it, and now we're getting back to that idea of taking a picture versus making a picture. Okay, so yeah, we want to try to apply meaning. So that's my, there it is, my, my thing on landscape photography. That's funny because like by the time that you guys get to the end of 
hearing me talk about all kinds of different types of photography, you're going to be like, what do you like in photography? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like shooting portraits. I don't want to shoot weddings. I don't want to do families. I don't want to do newborns. I, don't, I do like doing landscapes. I do still like doing landscapes, but yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind, of, I'm kind of strange in that respect, is here I am, I teach photography, and there are so many forms of photography that I'm just so incredibly bored with. Now that's not to say that there aren't people who aren't doing incredible things in those areas, but, um, oh, okay, so here's an example. This is a, a good example of framing, and it's also a really cool example of lines, uh, but how uh, we're creating, you know, showing some of the depth as we go further and further up this uh, stairwell. And I, I love staircases. That's another thing you guys find. I like black and white, and apparently I really like staircases. Bicycles, I love taking photographs of bicycles. That's what, I don't know why, it's just one of my things. Don't like landscape photography necessarily, but bicycles, I'll shoot them all day. <laughs> all right, did I skip something? Uh-oh, go back. Okay, mergers. Mergers. Now, I talked about how the, a lot of these are interconnected. Mergers are one of these ones that are really, uh, that's really connected to uh, simplicity. Mergers are uh, essentially when, you know, again, this kind of has to do with how uh, we're taking this three-dimensional world and we're flattening it. We're turning it into something two-dimensional. So back to this portrait I'm going to take of Lindsay. Like if I take the portrait of Lindsay right now, and my and I don't do anything. I don't change my perspective, and I maybe I even have you know it doesn't even matter. I don't think if I have a shallow depth of field, she's got a, he, a chair growing out of the back of her head. Okay, we want to cut down on these distractions, and this is actually something more complex than you might think. All right, our brains. We've, we've t I've said this a couple times. Our brains are this incredible tool, and they do such an incredible job of filtering information out for us. Like, when I look at Lindsay, I don't see that chair. When I look at Brad, I don't see the printer and the desk. You know, if I look at Eric, I, you know, I, I, I have not paid attention to the monitor behind him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at the individual people. My mind is able to filter out a lot of that information. So the problem is, is that when we take our cameras and we're composing photographs and we see something that we think is interesting that we want to take a photograph, we put the, we put the camera up to our eye. It, if we're not deliberate in how we look at that photograph, we're going to miss those things. And it happens all the time. In fact, it happens. I mean, for in you know, different forms of photography, it happens a great deal. Uh, the example I use in my uh, uh, in the digital photography class is a photograph I took of my son many, many years ago, and uh, we were at. I was. It was one of those. I chaperoned the kids to the on the trip to Fort Laramie when they were like in grade school. This is a long time ago. He's he's uh, 20 years old now. Anyway, uh, and he had uh, he had horrible allergies. So we're at Fort Laramie. We've been there all day, but I want, I'm dad. I, I want to get pictures of my kid at Fort Laramie with the you know the guys dressed up in the uniforms and everything like that. But he's I mean his allergies are so terrible that like I mean you can see his the, how, how swollen and red his eyes are, and uh, and I've actually even had to bribe him to to pose with these folks. I'm like I was like okay I'm gonna get you uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna go over to the trading post. And I'm going to get you a sarsaparilla. I'm going to get you one to drink and another one to just hold over your eyes because your allergies are so bad right now. So, But he's not happy. He's like doing this thing while he's standing in front of his – but I'm, I, I just want to take the picture. So I snap the photograph. And, you know, I, I, I have done my job. I have done my dad duty. I have, I have documented this momentous occasion. And then later on I'm looking at the photograph and there's people behind them. They're backlit. There's like a stairwell growing out of their backs. There's all kinds of just garbage going on in this frame because I was in such a hurry just to take this, this, you know, this picture of my son with these two people dressed up, you know, you react or what do you call those? Reenactors? Re 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 yeah, something like whatever. There's probably a more eloquent word for that. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm just focused on that. 
the photograph is terrible. Now you can't even look at it. It's awful. Yeah, I mean, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, crap. There it is. I ruined the moment. I'm a terrible dad. I went from having this great dad moment to, I'm a terrible dad, and we'll never be able to remember that day properly. Actually, you can. It's like, you can see how miserable the poor kid is in the photograph. But that's what I'm talking about, is that it's so easy for us to just filter that information out. So one of the things about photography is that you essentially have to retrain yourself to see to a certain extent. There are some things where, you know, You've been a visual communicator. You've been using your eyes your whole life, and that is to your advantage. And then there are other ways in which our eyes and brains are such effective tools that we don't see the mistakes we're making photographically until you make that first print and go, oh, I missed it. So you have to, to you know, as much as you can, with, you know, particularly with mergers and simplicity, Train yourself to say, okay, no, nope, that's not going to work. You know, I got, I got. There's too much going on behind her, so I need to move a little bit to this side. Maybe I'm going to use a shallow depth of field, or maybe this isn't going to work at all, and I need to put her in a different setting to get this photograph and actually make this photograph work well. Okay, so you, there's a little bit of retraining. Now, there's different types of mergers that we look for. Um, uh, we, we have the two big ones are. Uh, uh, near mergers and border mergers, okay? Near mergers are like we're talking about with Lindsay where she has this chair growing out of her head, okay? That's a near merger. So two objects kind of layered behind each other. The other kind, the border merger, is where we've composed an image fairly well, but there are things around the edge of the frame that can be distracting. We want our eye to go to the subject we don't want there to be anything in competition with that subject. And a, like a little object up here, I touched the board, the world didn't end. <laughs> if there's a little object up here that's you know, high enough contrast, like you know, for this, you know, if it was like a white object up there, your eye is naturally going to want to gravitate to that object. So you have to watch for those objects. Oh yeah, and I love photo mommy. <laughs> I, I am your near merger. <laughs> I was I once earned an award for being the best photo bomber. And one day maybe you'll have that honor. Let it be noted. <laughs> What's that? Let it be noted. Yeah, let it be noted that if I see you taking photographs, I'm gonna go. <laughs> it's my favorite thing to do. That's uh, well, now nah, I'm more of the kind of guy. I like doing that one. All right, uh, so when you're looking, oh, it did do something. Oh boy, oh gosh. What? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move over to the board and see if I can, or the computer, and see if I can't fix what I've done here. All right, and now down to the bottom. And da -da -da. Let's see if I know what I'm doing. Da -da. And then let's, here's, yeah. So let's look at, this is the kind of image that I'm talking about where, you know, it's not necessarily a terrible image. There's, this is not an awful image. It's a beautiful moment. It's, it, it, you know, it's so, and, and there are some really nice things going on here, but look how complicated it is. You know, it were, was there a way to do a better job of capturing this image that would have, you know, it, that it would have focused more on dad and bride and made a more impactful image. I think they're supposed to stand, actually. Yeah, maybe, well, just saying, maybe, maybe, yeah. If the photographer was down and maybe leaning back to focus more. Uh, okay, there we go. That's more reasonable. Like, you, you can't be at a wedding and be like, would you people sit down? Okay, you have to work with what you have. So the photographer has to recognize that he has all these things going on. And Megan's right. The photographer needs to look for a different angle, perhaps. Like, in my, in my opinion, really, if the photographer moved to his left and maybe down just a touch, maybe even just to his left, uh, and he could have gotten a better like image. Out in the middle of the aisle. Yes. And I know that sounds like people are like, how could you say to do that at a wedding? Okay. Here's one of the things about get, being a good photographer. If you want to be a good photographer, embarrassment is not an option. 
Yeah, I, I talked to you guys about like, you know, how I used to take photographs and I'd like shy away and hide in a corner. And my photographs were crap. Okay. It, it was back to that uh, Robert Kappa uh, quote if your photographs aren't good enough, you're not close enough. You have to, you know, be brave. You can't be afraid of embarrassment. If you want to get the shot, and even in a case like this with a wedding, they'll thank you later. They might not like you at the moment. And you can even like communicate that and say, look, hey, are you guys going to be you know, okay with this? You know, I'm going to be moving around. You know, if, I, if I use a flash, the flash is going to pop. It's just the way it's got to be. And prepare them. And I embarrass my wife everywhere I go. <laughs> I've been at like a bit, like I'll be, I'll go to like a, 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 like I'd watch it like one of my daughter's musical performances when she's in high school and I got, you know, camera and big lens and I'm like leaning over the seats and my camera's like, fuck, 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 fuck. My wife's like, stop it. You're embarrassing me. You know, you can't, it's, you just, if you want to get good photographs, you're not going to get good photographs hanging out at the back of the room, staying out of the way. You got to get in there. Like, think about like, uh, think you know, events like, uh, like a big press conference. Okay, where where do photographers sit for an event like that? Yeah, they get right in the front. They'll like sit down in, the, in front of people. Like, there's a podium. And then there's a row of seating. They'll sit in front of the row of seating on the floor with their camera and their equipment. And they're just like snapping away because they've got to get that shot. Do you want to get the shot or do you want to just get like, you know, a, a crummy shot from way in the back of the room that nobody cares about? You want impact. You know, that's how you make, the, that's how you improve this shot. That's how you avoid the mergers. Simplify this. Okay. Yeah, you got to be quick. You got to get out of the way. And there's, I got all kinds of fun stories. I told you, did I tell you guys the story about my my near death experience with a baseball? No. Oh, <laughs> so I'm shooting a baseball game, and I tell, I ask the coaches and the refs. I say, yeah, I want to, you know, get out on the field. Is that okay? You know, I'll stay in foul territory. And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever, go ahead. You know, it's just like. It's like it's it's like a prep game, so it's not like it's a pro game or anything like that. Prep being high school. Uh, anyway, so I'm I get out there and I'm like on the third base line. I'm just like just outside of the line. I'm just in foul territory, and I pick my camera and I'm looking at the batter and I'm basically trying to time. I'm like watching, you know, out of one eye. I'm watching the pitcher wind up and throw, and then I'm trying to time when the batter swings. So I I'm set up. I see the pitcher pitch, and then just as I hit the shutter trigger and my shutter flips, just before it goes black, that moment that it goes black because my image is being exposed, I see the batter swing, I see the batter make a connection, and I see the ball coming directly at my camera. It is like coming right at me. And I mean, in this moment, this split second, I have to decide what to do. It's not, I don't have time to like go, is it really coming at me? <laughs> I just like dropped. I literally dropped right on the ground. I didn't even I didn't even move the camera away from my face. I just went I just fell right backward. As and fast as I possibly could. And I mean the ball went right over my head. But you can, I could hear the I'm like as I'm going to the ground, I can actually hear the fans going, Oh because they think they're they're absolutely certain that I am about to die. <laughs> that baseball is coming right at me. Somebody needed a shot of my it would have been great. I would, I would, honestly, I would give about anything to see that. Because I'll bet the look on my face was like, you know, <laughs> it was probably pretty comical. All right, all right. Yeah, uh, did I don't remember. It was too long ago. It was too long ago. I was. I see. How old was I? I was like, I was in my early 20s, and now like I got the gray hair and the and the old timers going on, and yeah, I don't remember that stuff. Yeah, Bill were just 20s. Yeah, I, I actually started getting gray hair when I was in my 20s. I blame my daughter. I've named most of these Elise. That are Elise. The ones in my beard are are Dalton. Yeah, that's what I've decided. I, the weird thing is, is that I, I just wish it would just go completely gray, except instead of this, like, salt and pepper. Yeah, what? I mean, it's only on the sides. What the hell is this? 
That's crazy. I'm, I'm, no, I, I don't know. You, you don't, yeah, guys don't do that. They shouldn't. They shouldn't do that. All right. Okay, so form and shape. Let's move on here. I want to get to showing you guys some examples. So we've actually already talked about this. Our brain, we, we, just, we constantly are trying to find shape, pattern, and apply meaning to what we see, even if it's something simple. So even when we're talking about, like, just, you know, shape, uh, shadows, you know, just uh, basic, you know, geometric shapes or organic shapes, any type of, you know, uh, any type of uh, negative or positive space, we are trying to apply meaning to that, okay? So we can try to uh, capitalize on that. We can use it to guide the eye. We can use it to try to communicate uh, ideas or emotions if we're trying to simplify and uh, you know, show something in a different way. And there's all kinds of great uh, examples of photographers who are uh, engaging photography in ways that you wouldn't typically imagine or think of. Uh, and like I said, sometimes some students will look at these things and they'll say, that, that's considered art or photography? You know, so, so uh, brace yourselves. Some of these things you're going to look at and you're not going to like, you're not going to think that there's maybe that much to it. But uh, it's, this is kind of the beginning of a journey for us, for, for you guys. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that, you know, I just really enjoyed about, you know, studying photography was just the opportunity to get exposed to so many different ideas and what those different photographers were trying to communicate with their work. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this as much as I do. Uh, now this gentleman, uh, his, his last name is Safdie, uh, and cl clearly you can see what he's trying to do here. What do we have here? Eyes. So uh, yeah, yeah, they're eyes. But what's the object uh, really? Jeez, yeah. Stop trying to break stuff back there, guys. Gosh. Okay, so he's he's essentially he's looking for you know uh, anthropomorph anthropomorphism or bio, bio I can't say it biomorphism uh, in objects that he sees. And Ed, he actually this isn't the only one that he, uh, the, the only uh, type of thing that he looks for. And we have some other examples of his work. A little bit uh, further down, uh, but you know he's doing this. He's he's basically using uh, value, space, shape, form to kind of play tricks on us, to take some one thing and give us the idea that there's something else going on with it. Because like we said, you know our brain is it, it's it's kind of always trying to find these things and apply meaning. Okay, so we have a couple of different ways that you know shaped form uh, can occupy space. We have positive space, negative space. Positive space just simply means occupied space. Negative speeds, space means unoccupied, empty space. And, and honestly, it's kind of a, if you really think about it, it's kind of a, uh, you can think of it uh, the opposite way. Because uh, like when we see this a lot of time, we'll actually see something where you know, and images reversed out where we basically have simplified the outline of an image and you know the, uh, the the positive space is black the negative space is white but I mean you can reverse that as well so it's just basically the idea of using light and dark to create you know to or to recognize different space and shapes So, but it's completely subjective. It's arbitrary. <clears throat> okay, value is just uh, a really simple concept. So just some basic art definitions here. Pretty simple. Uh, it's relative lightness, darkness of a color. Okay, so we're basically looking for uh, using value contrast to uh, recognize and use these shapes to our advantage. And then black and white photography, we, it's a, we really have a great opportunity here. It's one of the things that when I, uh, one of the, I, probably one of the reasons why I really still love black and white photography so much, uh, even beyond the fact that I just really enjoy, still enjoy the dark room, is because it actually in itself is a simplification of photography. Not to say that you can't create simple color images, 
But in some cases, when we have a color image that's really complex, one of the ways that we can make that image work better is to get rid of the color, to simplify it by focusing just on the value, the light and the dark. Okay, so black and white photography actually gives us a, a lot of opportunity when we're talking about uh, value. And then uh, again, these uh, forms of photographic involvement. So the we're, we're not necessarily going to take these in any particular order. Uh, we're going to talk first about what we call constructed artistic involvement, uh, specifically as it pertains to abstraction. So I'm going to talk about uh, depictive involvement and constructed, uh, I'm sorry, representational <laughs> artistic involvement, just to help you guys to uh, get a little bit of context here. And we'll build on this. So again, we have, there's um, depictive, uh, representational, constructed, and assisted reality. Okay, these are the four types of artistic involvement. Um, depictive. Depictive, depictive involvement is pretty simple as a concept. You, you see something, you capture what it is. You're simply depicting what that is. Uh, now, there's a lot of, we're going to talk when we get into documentary photography, that it's subjective. And sometimes documentary photography isn't complete, completely depictive. In fact, a lot of documentary photography is representational. Okay. So the idea of rep representational artistic involvement is that we're taking it a step beyond depictive. So again, again, this idea of the difference between taking and making. We're not just going to see something and make a photograph of it. We see something, we recognize some value in that subject, and we are going to try to do things in the way we compose the photograph without necessarily manipulating the scene to enhance that you know idea or emotional connection that we have with that subject so we're not it's not just simply depictive we're not just saying here is something i am documenting it it is here is something that i find uh, alluring for one reason or another and now I am going to compose this image in such a way that I am trying to enhance that that value and perhaps even communicate that value with other people all right and abstraction is I, I see abstraction as representational uh, because you're in, in fact in some of these cases it's even kind of like found art we're just finding, you know, some of these photographers are just finding these pieces and taking photographs of the pieces. Uh, and you, you might argue some of them are actually still depictive. That's, that's why we have these as a framework to have these discussions. Uh, and that's kind of what it makes it fun. <clears throat> okay, so abstraction, the idea of abstraction for those of you who are, you know, haven't done a lot of, had a lot of art classes or haven't had an opportunity to talk about this. So basically, uh, the idea of abstraction in photography specifically, that's why it's a little bit tricky, uh, is that we're trying to essentially uh, remove the, 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 uh, the object, the original meaning of the object, and apply some other meaning or idea to it in some cases. So hopefully you guys can see how this is a good stepping stone for us to, you know, kind of jump in and look at photography in a different way and again get, you know get to this idea of making a photograph as opposed to just taking a photograph okay <clears throat> so again this is the same thing i've already been talking about but uh, abstractions in photography are a little bit tricky because we're at abstraction in art we may just like we have this giant canvas and we splash paint all over the paint canvas and then one red brush stroke, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that would, could be considered, you know, so, uh, you know, abstraction and uh, there's probably some reason why when you see these pieces of artwork construct made these way, this way, that the photographer, something they're trying to communicate with that. They're trying to get you to engage and think about that and come up with some sort of explanation or connect with it in some way on purpose. 
we do this we try to do the same type of thing in photography but because it's a, fo a photograph inherently people are always trying to connect meaning to that thing okay it's not it's not as easy to do because it's like you know as we go through these photographs like you know we looked at the first one and what do we say what do you see and it was actually great because Lindsay said eyes so that was the first thing she said Safdie did a great job he's a really good photographer when it comes to that type of work because she didn't immediately say it's a tree okay we knew it was a tree right but we, he did a good enough job in the way he was composing it that the first thing that she said was its eyes you know so that's the kind of thing that we want that's what we want to try to do people are always going to try to connect with the actual object is there we go so our, a good one here and this is a straight uh, what we call uh, not what we call. <laughs> I'm trying to make make a uh, like a, a genre out of it. Uh, this is a Paul Strand. <laughs> and I was gonna say what we call a strand. I don't know. What, yeah, I want to go with it. We call it a strand. No, uh, this photograph is by Paul Strand, and he's actually uh, he's someone that's uh, considered one of the uh, first uh, significant American abstractionists when it came to photography. He's a kind of interesting character. So, what do we have here? A chair. Table, yeah. Yeah. I, honestly, I have no idea what it is. I agree. I, it's. I'm, I'm thinking it's a table. It's a deck. But we, but see, do you see how he's for? He's just trying to focus on the the, the space, the value. Okay. Well, not necessarily trying to confuse you. I, I think that in a lot of cases, some of these photographers, they're not necessarily. Sometimes, with the photographer, are, the photographers are actually trying to communicate something completely different. Sometimes. They're just trying to give you a different way of looking at something that you see all the time every day. So it's not necessarily that you're trying to, it's like, convince you to think of that object in a completely different way as if it is something else, although some, in some cases they are. Strand really, Strand was uh, an interesting uh, character because uh, his photographs are just very cleanly composed. And, and I don't see uh, in, in a lot of his work that he was really trying to focus on uh, the aspect of the abstraction where we're trying to give people necessarily another message or idea so much as he was kind of seemed to just be fascinated and experimenting with uh, dark and light. Okay? Are all these photographs similar to that? Uh, actually, that's he did so many. There's some of them. Uh, it, uh, he did a lot of them that looked kind of like that. Uh, he did some still lives. In fact, there's another one coming up here. And then if you really uh, dig in and look at a lot of his work, some of it's like I don't even know that I really get what he was trying to do. <laughs> other than well, no, I mean because I mean there are some photographs where it's like he was in this neighborhood. And it was overcast, and but then there was some kind of side light. So even though it was overcast, we still had these hard, hard shadows and, and highlights. But really, to me, it's like there's a house and a sky and a fence. But he was pretty fascinated with it. And then a lot of other people like look at it completely differently. So here's the thing. I'm going to show you a lot of photographs. I like Strand. I'm not going to say that like I like get every single thing that he ever did or love every single thing that he did. I'm going to show you some other photogra photographers just for context, not necessarily because I think their work is particularly good or interesting, just be but because I'm trying to expose you guys to some other ideas and different ways of looking at things. Okay, so it's not always about like, I, I try to, uh, one of the things that I valued most about when I was working on my uh, MFA was uh, I had a couple of classes that did a fantastic job of getting me to challenge my own ideology. Okay, uh, one of the things that you know, if you're working in a visual communication, it's easy to do is you have your ideology, you have your way of looking at the world, and you can get, it's easy to kind of get stuck in a rut. And you're always kind of looking at things in a similar way. 
And the great thing about a couple of the classes that I took, uh, one of them was a history of photography class, and then another co uh, course I took was called Art and Ideology of the 20th Century. And they were fantastic. The, uh, the history of photography was fantastic because it talked about the cultural context of photography, that you know, here was what photographers were doing, this is what was going on culturally, and this is how, how their work had an effect on society. All right? And in some of those cases, there's photography that you look at and you think, well, this isn't beautiful, really. In fact, it's hard to look at. One of the best examples that I have of this is there was a photographer, and this is, uh, I, I think this is like the last 30 years, but uh, he took photographs of domestic abuse victims. And it was, they were confrontational photographs. So in some ways they were, it was basically like he would take photographs of these people just like staring the camera down. And it's, it was horrifying because you saw the, the, the bruises and the, you know, the burst capillaries in their eye. And it, it just was this, these awful, awful, awful images. And yet they're staring at you. They're engaging you. And, and it's, it's, you go through this crazy range of emotions looking at these images, you know? But, it, it, so at first you might think, well, like, God, why would anyone do this? This is horrifying. Well, I don't want to look at this, you know? But there are, there are example after example after example about how photographers engage in this type of work present that work to the public, and, and then what happens? You're wow. nodding at me, but say it. What? People see the result. People see it, and then what do they do? Become active. They become active. Okay, so the idea here is, is that a lot of the things that we see in photography, there's different reasons, there are different meanings why, we, why photographers are engaging in this. And uh, social activism is actually one of those reasons. We'll talk a lot about social activism in this class. Um, and really, photography is incredibly powerful from that perspective. Um, in fact, I'm, uh, I, I'm not sure where I'm going to do it, but I like to show uh, a, a film called War Photographer. There's this photographer, James Noctway, and I just absolutely love his work. Uh, he's still actually active. The guy is like 60, late 60s, maybe even close to 70 years old. He's still out there going into war-torn regions and taking photographs. And he sees his work as such, you know, a responsibility because the images that pe these people take literally can change how people behave, interact with one another. Uh, and then the other, uh, you know, some of the other things is, you know, just kind of, again, challenging your own ideology, uh, giving you a different filter to look at things through, and hopefully expanding your ability to, you know, create different types of narratives with your images. So hopefully I digressed there. Hopefully that made sense. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so again, Strand, one of the first American photographers to make, break away from uh, pictorialism. One of the things that my classroom section isn't getting that the I, I'm, I'm I'm doing more than one experiment this semester. It's the first time I've taught this class online. It's also the first time I've not required the classroom section to have the textbook. So I have to actually uh, explain this a little bit more to those of you who don't have the textbook. So uh, one of the another interesting thing about photography. Uh, is uh, how photographers historically have tried to use it. Uh, a lot of photographers, uh, we went through this period called pictorialism where basically photographers were trying to break away from just straight photography, you know, clean, high contrast, sharp images. They were basically trying to create images that had, what we, we, would, we actually we say, painterly effects and yeah they're trying to like create the photographs in such a way they, they basically the photographers were like wait a minute I'm an artist like the painters and and the and the sculptors 
recognize my work. And so they, they were trying to find ways to uh, elevate their work. And that's where we enter, entered into pictorialism. Well, uh, Strand kind of broke away from pictorialism and in getting into abstraction. Uh, he wasn't the only one that was breaking away. I mean, obviously, you, you guys understand artistic movements, right? Like, what, uh, what is an artistic movement? No. no like, like, uh, like, um, okay, but every time we have a new artistic movement, how did that artistic movement start? Maybe people broke away from the norm. Well, they rejected it. So basically, every single artistic movement through history is someone saying, I'm not going to do it that way anymore. Okay, so there were a lot of people. It was, Strand was not the only person that was getting interested in abstraction. There were a lot of uh, other artists, painters, who were uh, in engaging in abstraction as well. In fact, uh, he was uh, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, influenced by them, Matisse, Picasso. Uh, so he was he was looking at some of these uh, other artists, so even though it's like we're trying, I'm breaking away, but no, I'm gonna follow these guys. <laughs> you know, so he was kind of seeing how some of these other artists were engaging in this different new way to try to engage audiences and communicate new things, and he wanted to see how he could do that with his art form photography. So again, getting away from the painterly effects. So this, this is the kind of the difference thing. The different thing here is that he was really an abstraction is really focusing on value. So light versus dark. So he wasn't trying. And we'll look at actually some abstractionists who are doing some things where they're they're actually still trying to. It's almost like a crossover of, of abstraction and pictorialism at the same time, but. He was, Strand was looking at photog photography uh, with, you know, the intention of creating very clean, high contrast images. <clears throat> and then uh, this next one we're going to look here is actually, it uh, was a, a kind of a big deal, I guess, in American uh, abstraction. So uh, kind of the, one of the first recognized ones. Uh, it was a, it, it is a, a still life. I lo I'm also I'm fascinated with still lives. That's that art, art and ideology class that I took. What are still lives about? Do you guys really know what still lives are about? I, I, I just like to, t to uh, kind of talk to people about what still because people like look at still life it's like the context that you have for still life is I take a bunch of objects because I'm in an art class and I throw them out in front of me and I paint them. But there's actually, a, it's really rich history to still lives that's just fascinating that you guys should check out. What are some common themes in still lives that you've seen? Ears. Okay, fruits. What? So fr fruit, there's a reason for that. What else? How you like, uh, uh, as an artist, do something with like your way of drawing it, as opposed to like you know, just making it like exactly even more basic than that. Like, just tell me, like, what are the common themes? What's that? Sometimes, yeah. I don't know. Go ahead. Shapes. Shapes, but like, what? what tell me some things. That, like, you've seen a lot of still lives. Like makeup commercials. You see a picture of it. That's a still life. No, not really. No, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about like even like. We're talking like, you know, paintings and drawings. Come on, Eric. I know you got one of them on the tip of your it's, – it's, it's, you're thinking of it. I know it. So you're talking like flowers. Flowers? Yeah. Fruit, flowers? I could see that, yeah. That's, but that, that could communicate what we're talking about. Uh, not so much, but sometimes – Okay, she just actually, she's just hitting on it though. She's just hitting on it though. How many of you guys have seen still lives that have things like candles, other time pieces, or a time pieces like uh, hourglasses, things like that? How many of you guys have seen a still life that has a skull in it? Yeah, I mean, maybe you guys have seen a still lives. So, what are the common themes there? Like candles, fruit, flowers, skulls. Why? Okay. They're about they're about time. They're about life and death. That's what the, that's the main theme of still lives. Which I, it's kind of interesting. I don't know why when we're taught to you know draw still lives, 
that the art teachers don't talk to us about. But this, if you, there's, it's, I, I'm so fascinated with it because when I discovered this and started looking at it, I mean, if you look back historically, this has been going on for so long. But that's how the idea of a still life, you know, started. Does that person not do their dishes? They're very clean. What are you talking about? Well, they're in the, like they're in the sink and they have hair right there. <laughs> okay, but let's, but again, let's so look at this. So we have, we have our pair. You guys are like, you said bowls because there's like bowls there. It's like, there must be bowls and still lives. <laughs> okay, uh, but you know, we do have some pairs. Um, but you know what we're looking at here is look at the way he kind of you know outside of in fact actually if you cropped in a little tighter and took away this pair do you see how closely he's focusing just on the values and the forms I'm not in my you know, come over here so my other students can hear me my absolutely nobody watching can see me that's okay. It's recording as well. They can watch it later. <laughs> but do you see what I'm talking about there? So you're with talking this? about a celebration of like the actual shape of the bowl, the contour. Of the, yeah, the he was. He was. Uh, he was actually studying the shapes themselves. He was looking for these high contrast, like looking for shadow and highlight. That's kind of what he was trying to do in a lot of images that he look, looked at. What kind of camera did he use? God, you know, that's a good question. I don't have the answer for it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing all the different types of cameras out there. He probably used a, what they call a view camera. Mirrorless which, view camera. Well, yeah, they were, they were plates. So you, he would actually, so it was like, you know, it's wood, brass, bellows, and then you would actually take and put a plate into the back of it after you've focused gotten your exposure you put so the plate actually has the photographic sensitive material in it you put the whole plate in then you remove the front of the plate that's exposed to light uh, well at you actually you know hit the shutter then move that back into position pull the whole plate down so I, I think that he was probably using a view camera when he did that so and you know Ansel Adams used a view camera as well so Oh, it's, it's, they were, yeah, it's ridiculous. If you think about some of these people who created some of the photographs that we celebrate now and what they had to go through to create those images. I told you guys about uh, uh, Jackson's uh, mule, Hypo, already, right? I think so. Yeah. He, uh, he, so he actually shot, he was a, a survey photographer. We talk, we're going to talk about him. Uh, when we get into documentary photography, uh, so he was actually documenting, uh, documenting uh, the the landscape. Like, like the United States, it's like we purchased all of this land out west. Now we have to convince people that it was a great idea. So they sent survey photographers back to, you know, document the land and then share those images and and they and then have some record of those uh, of those lands. Uh, well, he he was actually shooting glass plates. He, sh he did a wet plate collodion. And so your photographic material was actually a big glass plate. And he had this mule that he named Hypo. And Hypo carried his glass plates. So he'd been going around for however long he'd been going around because it was a pretty, you know, uh, it was it, taking one image was a lot more complicated than taking one image is for us now. And uh, Hypo tripped and fell and all of his glass plate plates broke. So he lost just tons and tons of work. So. so for those of you who maybe lost a roll of film this week, think of poor William Henry Jackson and what he he probably wanted to shoot that mule that day. He probably did. He may have. I don't know, honestly. <laughs> Hypo might have broke a leg. I don't know. All right. Uh, so others, uh, we had others. Uh, Weston is another one that was really interesting. He did some interesting things because he actually – He's, he's focusing on form and shape he's, uh, and value. Uh, he's uh, creating these high contrast image, images, but again, now he's really trying to get people to think about things in different ways. Uh, so we have these themes of biomorphism. 
And actually we have, hey, there's his, his name really big. Sometimes I think I've gone overboard with these things. So uh, he had a lot of themes uh, that with uh, his work. So you're going to see his images are tack sharp, super clean. Um, economy, simpl simplicity, big in his images. Now we see this kind of like he's really trying to separate form and function, like what the object is. He's trying to communicate different things about the object. Um, trying to create a, thir a three dimensional space. So we see uh, uh, framing a lot in his images. And then strong sense of graphic design. So you're gonna, hopefully you guys will see as we go through it how he's actually using like things like line to like lead the eye or create you know ideas or you know give people like ideas or emotions and then biomorphism and I have actually a couple of examples here so here's one uh, and hopefully you guys can see it so th I like this one I think this is a great example of uh, he's uh, trying to f show three dimensions he's also trying to heavily use line okay so I mean we can see what it is in this case but he's composed it in such a way that it's not really so obvious. He's cropped it tightly enough that he's creating kind of some dissonance. He, hopefully you can, you're feeling and beginning to see how he's trying to get us to see this in a slightly different way by cropping on it a little bit more tightly. I mean, if you shot this as a landscape, you would certainly want to shoot this much wider than he did, okay? And this is actually uh, one of, uh, he did a lot of uh, nudes and then uh, vegetables and fruit. And what he was trying to do is kind of show uh, the, how he was, he was tr basically trying to repeat shapes and patterns both in the human form and then in these other organic shapes. So I have these two next to each other for this specific reason. Oh, wait, cool. Sure, sure it's both natural. What's that? Yeah, I think so because yeah, so he he had that woman pose in such a way that you know he was trying he was he was focusing on the natural curves, the space and shape. He was using light and shadow, and then you saw how she he even had her kind of duck her head down to try to almost remove that identity, and then to look at this, he was trying to kind of show those repetitions in different organic shapes, because I guess we are organic shapes. <laughs> Some of us more so than others. Is that a pepper? <laughs> yes, it is. I took a couple What's that? Oh, he took tons. It was, he, there was like, nope, one and done. <laughs> he said, no, he, he took, I mean, he was prolific. And then again, here's you know that strong graphic idea or sense of graphic design using line. I can't decide which one, side of the board I want to be on. <clears throat> We're doing pretty good on time. In fact, I'm further ahead than I thought I was going to be. So maybe we'll have some more time to just, uh, if you guys have any questions. So now I'm just going to get this. Uh, I'm showing some different uh, artists, you know, more, uh, this, the Siskin it was after Weston and Strand, uh, but wasn't really contemporary. And then I'm going to show you some contemporary ideas as well. And Siskin was kind of into um, what you might call like found art. But uh, one of the things I really like about Siskin's work is that Hopefully you'll see he has this uh, kind of fascination with texture, okay? Like you, you feel how, you know, gritty it is. He's using line. He's even using as things as basic as just like point in these cases. But, you know, and then great, super sharp, high contrast images. Yes, there is. There's a lot on a board. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I actually had a student last semester, it was hilarious, when I did, gave this lecture. I mean, he literally, like, every time I went to the next photograph was like, oh, like he was in pain. By, like, he was pained by looking at these images. So, again, um, very, he's clearly, you know, he's, he's trying to, uh, or he's fascinated with texture. I'm, I guess I'm kind of the same way. It's probably why I like his work. 
And it was that actually, it, I think that was actually torn tar paper over wood. Did you guys not see that? Yeah, I saw that. Look you can like go back. I think this is tar paper, torn. Instead of looking at the white thing laying on the object, the white thing. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It, it, I mean, that's I think maybe what makes this a little bit more interesting. Because when you first really look at it, I thought it looked like a piece of paper that was writing on it. Someone started it on fire, tapped it out. And yeah, and then honestly, it's it there's there's such great line in this. It kind of has a cool uh, graphic design quality. And I think there is actually uh, some other ideas going on here. Like, what do we see here? What do you see other than tar paper and a board? There's like, I mean, just looking at it, it looks like there's a tiny lake in it too. I, I can see that. Okay, that's interesting. What else? I see alien <laughs> you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call that pretty close to what I see. I, I was thinking like this is kind of like a Picasso type thing, isn't it? Yeah. You see a nose and an eye, you know? Yeah. I suppose it could be an alien as well. Why not? Oh, oh what am I doing? Yeah, wrong know. computer. Wrong computer. Okay, now some contemporary work, and this is where I really get people going, ah! Oh! Okay, this is uh, Jan Gruva. That's Jan. Okay, <laughs> if you want to call him Jan, honestly, I have, I, I, sometimes I, I like study these things, and like, and maybe I had someone smarter than me tell, tell me how to say it at some point in time, but I could be pronouncing them all completely wrong. It could be Jan Gruva. That's how you say that. Okay, there you go. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, that just got far more confusing, but let's look at this here. <laughs> Nobody wants to say anything. No, I don't see a bicycle tire, but I'm glad you see a bicycle tire. <laughs> Oh, you know what? And maybe that is isn't. I can't be a bicycle yeah, tire. It looks like spokes. Yeah. Or a chair. You know what? I'm going to go with chair sounds more reasonable. Okay. But here's someone taking everyday objects and trying to get you to look at it in some different ways. That would be weird if it was a bicycle, but you know, uh, who, like who am I to judge? What is not weird I don't want to judge Jan. Their, their mm -hmm. bicycle could be sitting right there. In the Why not? Because I always have my silverware next to my bicycle. Well, <laughs> I mean, don't you guys? Well, Doesn't everybody? That is on a table. That's, that's, that's on a table. That's in the background. Well, and actually, that could, that's kind of an interesting thing. Maybe it is. I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe they're actually trying to create dissonance with that. A uh, little simpler. I don't see a bicycle in this one at all. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay, again, just, you know, this one's, I actually think this one's a little too obvious myself. Woo! And there's Safty that we were talking about. And here's some more. I think his work is just awesome. Or maybe it's. Is it mostly trees, or is it just? Is it yeah, a lot of a lot of trees. What do you guys see? A tree that's like praying. That tree. Looks okay. Scary. It's <laughs> very some Halloween. You know, maybe I don't know. And that's yeah. I think that's what he's trying to do with this here. This one, I dig this one. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you guys took that to a really creepy place, but I guess I can see why you think that. It looks like those plants in Harry Potter. That... Oh, they're mandrakes. Yeah. They're going to get us. <laughs> Cover your ears. All right. Okay, and this one is usually the big grower. Cool. <laughs> So did he use the wrong speed of film? What's that? Did he, did he use the wrong speed of film? <laughs> I, well, I, I would say that, and I think this is a she, actually. Oh, okay. But I I might be wrong. Are you trying to say stuff like that? What's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're like, I am an abstractionist. 
I got this next assignment. I'm good. No, it's it's fun in a way. I, and I don't. I mean, this is where you know. I, I don't know. I mean, I see. I've seen all kinds of Im images that, that you know were kind of along this line that are kind of interesting. But you know, here again, the idea is we have someone who's trying to capture something in a different way to try to get us to decipher or apply some meaning to it. So uh, they're using basically, they're using focus here as a way to try and get us to uh, disconnect from the original meaning and perhaps uh, get some other idea from it. Okay, when you look at these photographs though, I got try to think about like postmodern. Yeah, and, absolutely. Because you think about all the artists, you know, you've got everyone from Van Gogh to Speed this. Down, just basically kind of painting things out of focus, not, not as sharp as everybody else did, and they were considered geniuses. So if you were to paint that same image right there, some people, love it. yeah, so you're, you're, you might be right. You might be right. That's valid. I, I mean, I totally agree with that. And that's where photography is kind of different and interesting when we start talking about abstraction because people treat it differently than they do other forms of art. Because when someone looks at that, they think you don't have the technical know-how. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like, wow, look at this guy's film. He doesn't know what the heck he's doing. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. It's like, you know, like, uh, I can't even feel a good I mean, like, painting, it can be a technical field, but it doesn't have to. Mixing paint takes a lot of technique. I, yeah, I think, I think that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> I think you're insulting painters, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I, it's not like, I mean, like, when do you more like scientific and like rigorous, like sort of a mathematical sort of trained way to see things or, and, I think it's just a different skill set. It's just a different skill set. So, it's just I, what I what I think is interesting about what you're saying, and I, I mean what I'm getting from it. So I'm not saying you're wrong. What I'm saying is I I, I just would I kind of maybe explain a different way. Like, for, for a painter, something like this may be seemingly easy to create. But as a photographer, you actually have to, like, you, you can't do this on accident, really. You can't. And particularly, you know, we're getting back to that idea of shooting manually versus automatic. Can you do this on a camera with, that's set on automatic? No. You do have to, like Eric is talking about, you do have to have a certain amount of technical know-how and, you know, trust and have like a vision or some idea of the direction that you're going in order to create something like this. But it's really only other photographers who can create. Exactly. You're absolutely right. A lot, a lot well, but I mean, that's true of a lot of people. Like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm as hard on other art forms as I am on photography. Like, I can look at a painting that's painted realistically that is popular because it has a, a popular theme, and I appreciate the skill that goes into it, but I have the same opinion of that that I do of some landscape photography. It's like, well, why? What's the meaning? What's, what, what are you doing? What's happening here? Are you simply placating an audience that you know will purchase this work, or are you making a statement? So, but I'm, I'm weird like that. <laughs> and then another one here. I'll leave it up for a second. Because you, you guys seem to be like, after a couple of seconds, some of you guys are really forming some opinions here. You're handling this much better than my class, my daytime uh, class last spring did. I had one student who I thought I was going to have to like, you know, why don't you just step out of the room Take a few deep breaths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> well, it's just the idea of someone not wanting to do it the same way. I'm just trying to figure out what it is. Well, and actually, that's what I was going to talk about. Hopefully, you're starting to see one of the things that I think is, things that I think is interesting is that 
we don't see the same repetitive shapes and patterns. This one has a very distinctive look. It looks much different to me than the two we looked at beforehand. The two we looked at beforehand, I actually saw, and Joy's like, she's like, what the hell is he talking about? I saw that, Joy. <laughs> That's okay, Joy, you're not the first person. I get that all the time. But I, I mean, I feel like if we look at these ones, like look at, oh, okay. But I see a lot of circular shapes here and here. And then I see, yeah, far more linear, okay? So that's kind of interesting as well. Because the other ones, I'm like, I'm actually looking at this thinking, how the heck did she even do that? Because the, the, the circular shapes are easy because we have that idea of bokeh. You guys get bokeh, right? We getting that? What is bokeh? <laughs> bokeh is the idea that when your depth of field is really, really, really shallow, objects in the background blow out to such a degree that they actually take the shape of your lens. So that's why you see these images. Have you, I'm sure you guys have seen these images where they take a photograph and there's like a city skyline way out in the distance, but instead of seeing distinct lights, you just see a whole bunch of circles. That's bokeh. Or like the, when you see like traffic, uh, pictures of traffic doing a like zooming, no that, no, that's just a motion blur, really. I know what you're saying. Though. Like, hey, he's talking about if you've got a vehicle coming towards you, it'll have that focus, and as it gets closer, it'll sharpen up. That could be that, or they, uh, that could just be some lens flare, too. I guess it would depend on the... I, 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 have, I have a number of different Im images in my head with you describing that, so... Is lens flare, is purpose lens flare... Bokeh? No, because bokeh really is the idea that uh, it's just so far beyond the focal plane, and the focal plane is so shallow that it doesn't even, whatever shape it happened to be beforehand, no longer applies. It just becomes the shape of the aperture, essentially. Okay, And that's why some people are actually really interested in collecting different types of lenses that have different apertures like different patterns, like if they're, instead of more circular, they're kind of like, uh, well, ge like the, you can see the edges. And then, uh, how many of you guys have heard of a lens baby? There's a company that has produced a bunch of lenses where uh, they're basically, they're kind of like bellows lenses, but they have uh, creative apertures, like they have, basically you can cut out any shape that you want, put it into the lens, and then produce the bokeh effect by using that very shallow depth of field, and then whatever shape you put into that blank will be the shape that you see in the bokeh. Like, uh, stars or hearts or whatever. Stars or hearts, yeah. In fact, stars and hearts are actually, they, when you buy a lens baby, you actually get uh, apertures that are stars and hearts. They're just like, they come. Well, that's fun. Yeah. So if anyone wants to do any heart bokeh images. <laughs> can you have, like, a star for example? Can you just... Star Absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of uh, people that are doing this. Uh, you can actually, uh, it's pretty interesting. You can, there's a lot of DIY ways to do this. You can, with any camera, basically cut a shape into a piece of paper, tape that piece of paper over your lens, and do that same bokeh effect, and it will take the shape of whatever it is. So, I mean, you can, like, uh, Eric could put, uh, what is it? go to smooth this somehow into some paper, tape it to the front of his lens, and then, uh, you know, blow out the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the focus in the background, and it would actually say that. You know, that's his, his, he's got this kind of, I don't know what to call it. Is it a persona? I would say so. Well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the, 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 the Batman complaint in the I guess. Okay. I use it for my email addresses, gamer tags on Xbox. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I saw my hour work with it. Okay. All right. But you could do that with anything. All right. All right. And it's, that's it. Hey, there we go. So I, you guys didn't take me on too many tangents. I thought that was, that was actually pretty painless. So we made it through. That's awesome. All right. So, yes, there we go. Questions? What do you think it actually is, though? Honestly, I'm gonna. This is to me looks just like a street scene. I think that's a that's a street light. 
You can't see the pole? Yeah, I see the road. Okay, sure. This is me, looks Grass. like the beginning of Star Wars episode. Is it? Oh, is that? It's like you're on Tatooine. Yeah. You're on Tatooine. You're dehydrated. Yes. And you can't. You can't even focus out into the distance. Your speeder broke down, and you're looking for a droid. Yes. The good news is the droid you're looking for is nowhere near. <laughs> yes. I think it looks like a bead. It's like the bead block. And a ship. Yeah. No, I can no, see no, that. no, no, ship, the, the, that's the that's railing. The black is the railing, and that's the sunset. <laughs> it's like you're looking off the pier. Maybe, yeah. I think it's from the airport. Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Well, maybe that's the best part about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, reiterate, you guys do have another assignment due next Friday, so you guys got to... It's going to move fast now. It's going to, I know that you guys have felt, probably felt like, geez, this is a snooze. This guy doesn't ever assign anything for the first five weeks of class. But now it's going to start to move quick on you. But what's that? This yeah, this is the fifth week. We're in the fifth week. Next week for your A16 classes is midterm. Ah! Yeah, it's crazy. Don't worry. Your instructors feel the same way. I'm also going, ah! I wish the semester would slow down. I need more time. All right, so uh, again, assignment next week, value shape form. Um, for if, if you're shooting digital, be sure to pay attention, to look at the uh, rubric. I'm, I'm pretty clear on the rubric on what I'm looking for. Uh, you do have to shoot more. You do have to give me digital files. It does have to have the metadata that I can look at. You do still have to make prints. You still do stuff to make contact sheets. If you're not sure about how to do some of these things, let me know, and I will help you out. Uh, contact sheets are pretty. I think I have a video on contact sheets. If not, I'll record one. And then this is due next Friday, right? Next Friday. We're gonna start. We're gonna start cooking now. It's gonna go fast. What's that? Okay. Shoot. Of this last time, that's the only thing that came out. Well, and that, there was a reason why I had you guys shoot in those different lighting conditions because I'm trying to help you guys to recognize that it is more difficult to shoot in lower light and to troubleshoot. Hopefully, you're troubleshooting. Now, uh, I'm going to try to turn these around and have them ready for you guys for next week. Um, if you uh, want to talk up, if you need any help or need to talk about anything before then, of course, you guys know where to find me. Most of you have found that I that I kind of live here, so. <laughs> Much to my wife's chagrin. So, um, if, if you got, uh, like I said, that log sheet, uh, which one is your office? The one that with the big giant New York Jets logo okay. on it. I was that Although I was a Broncos fan yesterday, for those of you who, you know, may have seen on Facebook, and the Broncos lost. So I think I'm going to be a Broncos fan for the rest of the season now, and maybe they'll start losing and the Jets will start winning. That's my. This is what goes on in this head up here. I am a Broncos fan. What's that? Shirt, Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I need a Broncos shirt to wear on game day, so they'll lose and the Jets will win. I'm gonna work my mojo, even if it's like the like reverse. You know, I'm a bad luck charm. <laughs> All right, guys. If you don't have any questions, we'll see you next week. You have you're out like super early, so that means you guys can get a head start on your homework, right? Yes. Let me stop this. Oh. The print